Right, so in the spirit of being direct, let me tell you what I'm not going to talk about today. I'm not going to talk about the future because I have no idea what the future brings any more than anyone else. I'm also not going to talk about data, data centers or anything physical at all. I don't know anything about it. Why in heaven's name would I talk about it? What I am going to talk about, though, is that part of the future that has just arrived. Uh, there is a famous author, William Gibson, who said, the future's already here, it's just not evenly distributed. And if you want to understand the future, the easiest way to understand it is to look for evidence of it in the present. The reason it's important to understand our future is because we are currently suffering from a series of uh, failings in understanding the present that are largely down to human perception. In other words, there's a great deal of evidence in front of us of what's coming, but as people, we struggle to understand what we see. And that's, this happens quite regularly and over and over again. We are very, very good at internalizing the past. And so what would have seemed unbelievable to us just 10 years ago seems quite mundane to us today. But therefore, by perfect logic, what is unbelievable to us right now is about to become mundane. And we also are under some misimpressions because we like to put big names on small things. Very human. We like to big up, as it were, whatever we've seen. And so we call it big. So for example, we're currently using the word big data. Wrong. We currently use the word broad band. Wrong. What you really mean is not so narrow band and bigger than small data. That's what we have today. Data that's not so small and band that's not so narrow. And if you live in the UK, it's still pretty narrow. And if you live in Cambridge in the UK, it's really bloody narrow. But that's nothing personal. What I find very interesting about that is the future is already here. If I live in a one bedroom apartment in a tall tower block in Seoul, South Korea today, I enjoy a level of broadband there as a low end economy worker paying the lowest rent in one of the most sterile tower blocks that is well faster than the fastest broadband available in London or probably in Helsinki. In fact, the national goal for the UK in five years equals the broadband that was offered to pretty much every one apart bedroom apartment dweller in Seoul, South Korea five years ago. The future's already here. It's just unevenly distributed. So why is that important? Because what I'd like to think about today, what I'd like to explore with you is what happens after big data. But in order to do that, we need to re-baseline where we are. It's a very common human activity to re-baseline. We do it without thinking. This is the act of re-normalizing what we become accustomed to. And you do it all the time, right? As soon as you're accustomed to a certain speed of broadband, it's not speedy anymore. It's what you're accustomed to. And then speedy is the next thing you don't have. Well, let me reassure you, you're not yet re-baselining broadband. Furthermore, broadband isn't the issue. Because broadband, we think it's the issue. We think if there were more broadband, there would be more data. No. Data doesn't come from broadband. Data comes from sensors. Therefore, the pace in which data increases in the world is directly related on a nonlinear scale to the amount of sensors that are in the world. And the number of sensors in the world are growing much, much faster than the increasing scope of broadband. What do I mean by sensors? I mean everything. I mean our bodies. The art of wearing technology is increasing. And if you start thinking of the numbers tied to that, it becomes somewhat hard to believe. In fact, it becomes unbelievable. Which means what? If it's unbelievable today, it's going to be prosaic within a moment. Anything that's unbelievable right now is going to be believable and in fact accepted right now. Just one day from now, one year from now. Tripping into the future. And most of the stuff I have to talk about is awkwardly enough unbelievable. For example, let me go back a bit and let's talk about the perils of big data by looking at big data when it wasn't so big so we can take our, get our heads around it. The first most interesting example of big data and the huge mistakes it can make occurred in 1936 in the United States during the American presidential election. Theodore Roosevelt, nope, 
Yes, no, Roosevelt, the second, Franklin Roosevelt. Sorry, I don't remember my own history. Franklin Roosevelt was up in an election against, and of course nobody knows the answer because the other guy lost. His name was Langdon. And in an effort to call the election, the Literary Digest, a very preeminent publication in the US, decided to run the official poll. But because they were worried they'd get it wrong, they decided to run the biggest poll that had ever been run in history. They were gonna ask one quarter of the voting population, 10 million people by hand to fill in a survey and send it back to them. In the scope of the time, this was unimaginable. Almost beyond reckoning how they were gonna manage 10 million people's hand surveys in a period of time adequate to call the election, but they did. And they got a huge numbers of people, 2.4 million out of the 10 million responded. And they calculated. And they announced the winner with great confidence. They announced that Langdon was going to win the election by a 10 point margin. At the same time, a young poller named George Gallup, who had just started his firm, polled about 100,000 people. Much, much smaller audience. He said, that's not right. Roosevelt's gonna win, but nobody was listening to him because he only polled 100,000 people. The election came. Roosevelt won by a landslide. The Literary Digest had a big amount of egg on its face. They had seriously miscalled the election. There were newspapers all over the country that had already printed headlines. There's a very famous photo of Roosevelt holding a piece of paper, a newspaper saying Langdon wins with a big smile on his face. So how'd they get it so wrong? Well, I mean, it's down to two very well-known and simple issues that if you've ever been involved in polling, you'll know about that sample error and sample bias. Sample error is the situation when, from a population of people that have been randomly chosen, they accidentally return answers that have a bias in them. That's why we have confidence measures. So, you know, say within a range of 10%, blah, blah, blah. And that happens in every possible act of polling. But the big brother to that, the evil side of that, is not sample error, it's sample bias. And that's when the collection wasn't random at all, right? That's when you didn't have a random population, which is, of course, what happened with Literary Digest. They used two lists. One list they used were telephone directory listings, and the other was automobile registrations. There's a problem with that. In the United States in 1936, if you had a telephone and or a car, you were prosperous. So what they found the answer to is that rich Americans would vote for Langdon. It's a shame that most Americans weren't rich. They had the most precise answer to the wrong question you could have ever asked. Sample bias. Now you might think, well, this is A, true, B, irrelevant, and C, somewhat obsolete. Well, it's become very relevant again. You see, because big data is about one of two types, either structured data, somebody's collected it and organized it, or ill-formed data, which is really where the interesting stuff happens. And people are starting to think that N equals all. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is people have gotten into their heads in big data discussions that if we have a large enough number of people, almost unbelievably large, then that's everyone. N equals all. Well, it doesn't. N equals almost all. Why is that an issue? Because almost all is not all. You have sample bias. Why is this important? Well, hold that thought, and I'm now gonna tell you a couple of stories. And at the end of it, the answer to the story is, oh shit, sample bias. The problem is for the actors involved, it can be a big deal, can't it? So for example, mind you, sometimes it comes out true too. So let's take an example of a non-sample bias that I think was really interesting. There is a department store in the US called Target. Target positions itself as the best of the cheap. So it's high-end discount all over the country, huge corporation. And Target began an activity of collecting data about its customers. And of course, it, what it collected was purchase data. They buy this, they buy that. And what they were looking for was correlations. What they were hoping for was causation. I'm sure you understand the difference. Correlation means two variables are in some way linked. Causation means this variable causes that variable. 
A rather well-known diet data scientist said last year, correlation is the new causation, meaning it no longer matters what causes one. If we know the two are somehow coactive, we can therefore act upon it. Target, without ever knowing that, took that to heart. And so they started, they had some data geeks who were not known for their social skills, tie together time-based data on people buying one thing and then sending them coupons for other things that they were likely to buy because other people in the past clearly bought them having bought the first. Or maybe it was the other way around. Well, this all came to the head when a newspaper story broke of a man, a middle-aged man in the Midwest, going into a Target store and having a fit a breakdown, a yelling, he went postal as we say in America, at the manager of this Target store. How dare you, he said, how dare you send coupons for pregnancy stuff and diapers to my 15 year old daughter? What kind of immoral company are you running suggesting that she go get pregnant? The manager apologized. But of course he shouldn't have, because it turns out she was pregnant. Target knew more about her condition than her father did, which possibly, of course, is not as all that surprising as you may imagine. But Target didn't know she was pregnant. Target just knew that she bought unscented wipes over a certain period, at a certain pace. And people who buy unscented wipes, it turns out, later on start buying diapers. Hmm. Target knew she was pregnant. Walk into an American supermarket you will find a very odd combination of products sometimes. For example, you will see, if you're familiar with an end cap display, that's the display at the end of an aisle, which is purchased intentionally by manufacturers to present their goods. You will occasionally see, in some American supermarkets, a large pile of beer, because beer is something people buy on impulse, and next to it, a pile of diapers, nappies. Now you may say to yourself, why in heaven's name would somebody put beer and nappies together? Well, it turns out that the data says that when men buy beer, they buy nappies at night. Anybody know why? Because this is what happens. A man and a woman are at home. A woman has had a baby. That's pretty much a given still. She's sitting there with a baby. They need nappies. Who gets to go out and get them? The man. He's at the store. He says, I need nappies. He goes, oh, beer, that's a good idea. And he goes home. The beer does not cause the nappies. Well, actually, if there's a nine-month delta, they might. <laughs> but that's not what we're talking about. At a mo moment of contemporaneous purchase, the beer and the nappies are highly correlative. And in fact, you can see a huge increase in the purchase of beer if it's piled next to nappies at stores late at night in urban metropolises in America. Strong correlation. No causation. Effective selling. This is the trivial consequences today of big data. Well, of ill-formed data in large enough sets from which we can draw useful selling conclusions. You notice I didn't say big data. I said ill-formed data in sufficient size that we can draw useful conclusions from correlations that can drive purchasing activity, right? But what happens if it did get big? Anybody here familiar with the expression the quantified life? The quantified life deals with a new phenomenon that's happening, and it's growing tremendously quickly. And it deals with people who want to measure their lives because it's well known as a human activity that a measured life, anything measured, is improved. And anything not paid attention to is unlikely to improve. Right? If you, want to ex if you expect it, you should inspect it, goes the old saying. Well, this is true for us as well. As humans, if we are consistently confronted with a series of numbers, our behavior will change based on the feedback we get. A quantified life says, measure everything and you'll lead a healthier life. And all of a sudden, we can. And so the wearable technologies are coming out. If you're interested in the area, literally go Google quantified life and go be surprised how many millions of people are trying to do this. And there's an entire explosion of an industry out there of wearable technologies and fitness tools and platforms and APIs all tied to measuring your whole life, your physical, emotional basis. 
from a sleeping to awake, and it's all what? It's just piles of new sensors. Piles of new sensors. All where? Out on the edge. And it's not actually being collected by a central organization. It's being collected by the consuming person. So when people talk about data now being interactive, that it being a co-production world, it being all happening at the edge, well, that's where humans are, at the edge. That's where the sensors are, at the edge. That's where the data is, all at the edge. And a quantified life is very interesting because it creates an enormous amount of data, right? I'm sure I'm going to get this wrong because I can never remember all the acronyms, but I believe a petabyte is a thousand terabytes, a terabyte is a thousand gigabytes, a gigabyte is a thousand megabytes, and a petabyte and a zettabyte is a thousand thousand petabytes. And we collected a zettabyte in the last two years globally of data, which is slightly larger than the sum of all data that had ever been collected by all humankind prior to the last two years. I view that as a wonderful statistic because I have no idea how big a zettabyte must be, though it sounds unbelievably big to me. But that's OK, because a petabyte sounds unbelievably big to me, as does a terabyte. Therefore, my ability to comprehend a zettabyte is precisely zero because I can't comprehend something three orders of magnitude smaller than it, nor can you. So there you go, it's a zettabyte. That must be big, right? No. So how much information does one human spawn in a day? Approximately a zettabyte. If you measured everything, every neural impulse, every function of us body, if it were possible, which it's not, and it's what? It's unimaginable. We spawn more as a single human being than the sum of all information and the sum of all history collected in the last few years. We don't, haven't touched big data. We're still at the infancy of big data. And yet it's coming like a truck. The Internet of Things. What is the Internet of Things? Nothing more than sensors attached to any device that has any bearing on anything. Right? So for example, they're building a new cycleway in London at great discussion. A cycleway being a dedicated lane for cycles to ride across because we keep on knocking off cyclists in London, inadvertently, I presume. And so they're going to put a north-south one and an east-west one. And they're going to put sensors, really cheap sensors, not particularly reliable ones, but they're pouring them into the tarmac. So they're going to be sensed cycleways. Oh my God, are they going to throw out a lot of information. But they're also going to be really useful. So they're going to throw out a lot of information. Nothing stops every sidewalk from having the same thing 10 years from now. Nothing stops every dishwasher from having it and every appliance from having it. In fact, from every single thing happening, a Kickstarter, if you're familiar with it, which is a crowd-based funding platform, had a company on it about two months ago called Tracker, I think. And using the modern parlance, they dropped a vowel to make themselves sound cool. So I think it's T-R-A-K-K-R, -K -K but I could be getting this wrong. And what they've devised is something the size of a tiny little battery that has a little stick -em on it, and you can stick it on anything you own and track it. And it's delightful. I bought 10, because I lose everything. And everything I now have is acceptable. And every consumer can do that. You can do that. I can do that. And you will do it. Because guess what happened? What, what's Tracker's first business model opportunity? They're not going to sell little things. They're going to sell the right to stick little things into other little things. So you don't have to find it. You'll be a Tracker-enabled device. Everything will be tracker enabled, whether it's tracker or their competitors. It's not hard to make the case for a whole bunch of data coming, for a cloud of data coming. What's interesting to me is what sits on top of an unimaginable amount of data, and what are the consequences for people who have to house it. I'll park that, because that's you guys, and go on to the unimaginable consequences. Because people are already doing super interesting things. I'll give you an example of a super interesting thing that people are already doing with data. It starts in an area that I'm working in, which is alternative finance. And it's kind of chilling. It happens that if I track where you buy things, and I can, I can probably find out where you buy almost everything in 2015, because almost all of the money you use is electronic, then I know what kind of shops you shop in. Well, there is a credit bureau in the U.S. that has just come up with an innovative idea. And that is they track creditability 
by shopping pattern. And what they mean by that is, I might reduce your, the conclusion this would be, I reduce your credit because you shop in places where other people who don't pay their bills shop. Right? So have you done anything wrong? No. You don't have to anymore. You just have to be just like people who do things wrong. And do you know what the problem is? Works super well. Fantastic. You are more likely to do something wrong. So for example, I'm running an alternative finance scheme right now, and what we're trying to do is deal with the fact that in emerging countries, there's a host of people who are essentially unbanked, meaning they have no formal relationship with the banking world, and yet we're trying to provide them micro loans. So how do you give a loan to somebody when there's no banking history such that you can determine whether they're good or bad credit and likely to repay the loan or not? Now, in historical microfinance terms, they didn't look at creditability. So if you look at Grameen Bank in Bangladesh, he looked at social ties in small cohesive communities to enforce peer-to-peer -peer pressure to return the loan. Because if you've got a group of eight women and one of them gets a loan, but everybody knows the next woman doesn't get a loan until the first woman's paid it back, then everybody in the group is going to pay attention to her to make sure she pays it back. It's a, great, it's a great alternative to trying to predict whether an individual will pay it back. But what happens if I'm sitting in a city in the rainforest in Colombia, and I'm not trying to work with a group of eight women, I'm trying to work with a population of 100,000 people, and I need to somehow figure out who's going to pay the money back when none of them have ever had a bank account. But I do know other things about them. So for example, when it was this same question was asked in Alabama about a poor population there, they had some shopping data. And you know what they found? They found unbelievable correlation between one item people purchased and whether or not they would pay their loans back. And that was the little bits of felt you put on the bottom of furniture to prevent it from scratching your floor. It would appear that people, if you're familiar with these, they're little stick them. You lift it up and you put it on, and then when the foot of the thing goes down, it sits not on wood but on felt, so it's smushy rather than scratchy. Well, apparently there's two types of people in this world. Those who are anal enough to do it, and those who are not. And if you're anal enough to care about your wooden floors by protecting the felt, you're apparently the sort of person who pays your loans back. Now you sit here laughing, thinking, I can see that. Well, I can true, but it doesn't make it true, it just makes it entertaining. And yet, it turns out to be true. And I don't think putting felt on the shoes of my furniture causes me to pay loans back. But apparently, they're, coexistence at, they're coexisting attributes of people who do. So does that mean if I don't put felt on the foot of my couch, I'm unlikely? Is the contrapositive also true? Well, I should think not, because what happens if I have carpeting? Exactly. I either have carpeting or I'm a bad debtor. Those are my choices. What happens if I have carpeting and I'm a good debtor, I won't get a loan. What happens if I don't have carpeting and I'm a bad debtor? That's the guy we gotta be looking for felt purchases from. This may or may not make sense to you. It makes perfect sense to me. And that is that there is no necessary understanding of the relationship of sample bias and of correlation to outcome. Why is that important? It's important because our power to correlate is about to become very, very large. So for example, if in the United States there's a new company, I think it's called Zest Finance. Anyways, what they're doing is they're trying to look at all of the ill-formed data that is available about a consumer to try to get a sense of whether or not they should lend the money. They're looking at their social media feeds, they're looking at their Facebook profiles, they're looking at their purchase histories, and they were recently engaged by a very large insurer. And one thing they realized is that people who buy clothing, men who buy clothing with a 38 inch or more, 38 waist inch or more, are more likely to die young. So if I know what kind of clothing you buy and the size of the clothing, I can discriminate against you with your health insurance. Now as it happens, far too many men in America have 38 inch waist. But that's a separate issue. I proudly can say, I'm not. But they're not, it's not directly related to the fact that these sorts of correlates create an ambience around us. So let's cast forward 10 years from now, and welcome to the world that's coming. Let's start with the question of who am I? 
Today, in order to know who I am, I have to assert myself on the world. I have to go to you and I have to say, this is who I am, and I have to prove myself. But picture for a moment a world where we are actually collecting so much about ourselves that I don't have to prove myself. Why don't I have to prove myself? Because you already know who I am. My footprint is undeniable. The beginnings of this are already happening. Think about it this way. Somebody comes to you and says, hey, I just heard about this new movie or this cool product or this shop. So what do you do as soon as you hear about something today? I'll tell you what you do. You pull out your phone or your computer, more and more likely your phone, and you open Google and you type it in. And if it doesn't take you to the website, you don't think it exists. The absence of a website in human nature right now, in 2015, you suspect not the information from your friend, but the fact of the thing at all. You all do it, we all do it. If you can't find it on the web, it probably doesn't exist. Now this is actually a false truth. The absence of something on the web still can exist, but that's not how we think about it. And we're not reassured something exists until we find it on the web. We're very suspicious of businesses that don't exist on the web. What does that mean? Well, it means if you cast forward 10 years from now, the same behavior happens. What happens if I cannot find evidence of somebody's identity, digitally or electronically? Do they exist, or are we suspicious that they're actually faking it? In other words, it's soon going to be the case that the absence of a footprint creates suspicion, not the assertion of an identity. This is not an issue of privacy. This is an issue of identity. You, it's not a matter of hiding. It's a matter of not hiding. Because any, any effort to be private is going to make you suspect. That is a profound issue. It means that presence creates reality. And your digital identity will create it because it's literally impossible for you not to have a massive digital identity. Anybody here who thinks they've got a protected identity is fooling themselves. There are more than enough large, mostly American, mostly West Coast, mostly Silicon Valley based companies that are already collecting so much data that they're not sure what to do with, usually through mobile apps, that you would be stunned about that, which I could know about you if I had the data tools to mine the data. You think Apple actually is innocent in the recent iCloud episode, where all those naked photos of stars were revealed last week? No, of course not. They just collect on iCloud, right? You turn it on, it all goes up there. We don't really believe that Google has a handle on this, do we? You shouldn't, because they're run by people just like you and me, as frightening as that may be. The only difference is they're, they think they're right because they're more arrogant. So we have a huge amount of ill-formed data growing, and we don't do well as human beings with order of magnitude change. We're fine with linear change. We can deal with the notion of more. We can't deal with the notion of step change. And so when something goes up by one or two or three orders of magnitude, it takes a long time for the curve of acceptance to grow next to it. The net result of that is we are already at the next order of magnitude of ill-formed data. And there is going to be an explosion. And I think it's fascinating to read most predictions about how much data there will be. And mostly it's driven by, well, the bandwidth will be here, and we're going to have 4K TV, and gosh, isn't the video going to clog the pipe? And then we're going to have more mobile broadband, and therefore we're going to need more data centers. The one business I really wish I were in is the data center business. I truly do. Because the, un the um, current underestimations of data and the amount of data coming is quite profound on a level that I'm not quite sure how the physical world will keep up. It will. We'll do something. Innovation always has its moments. But the physical world, as limited by power consumption, creation of power, physical infrastructure, is the gating factor. And it will be for quite some time, because the amount of data that's coming is far, far greater than the amount we've built. And on top of that, it is ill-formed data for which we're not prepared but which will provide us with an unbelievable insight into every individual in this room. All of us are going to be able to see into everyone else whether we like it or not. And government regulations and EU privacy laws don't begin to encompass the challenge. That's what's coming next. And that's within the next few years, because it's already started. And if you look at it through a lens of paranoia and optimism, which I shuttle back and forth between, on the paranoid side, I struggle to understand how an individual is going to be able to walk through the world in the next 10 years or further on 
and still be able to retain their rights, their identities, and their privileges. On the other side, optimistically, I see a world in which so many things can be solved. So many health issues can be solved. So many issues of agriculture can be solved. I'm working on a project now where we're predicting rain very accurately, and therefore shuttling crops in the lowlands of Colombia to match it, all based on what? Large-scale, ill-formed data from super cheap sensors. So wonderful things are going to happen at the same time, terrible things are going to happen. Our world is going to be polarized. It's going to be polarized around one thing, big data. And we haven't even gotten to big data yet. See, because that's coming next. That's what comes after big data. Big data. It's just we use the wrong term. Today we're talking about a bunch of data. So big data comes when we have everything hooked up. So what's that going to mean? Well, everyone here familiar with drones? Drones are fascinating. They think people currently think of drones as kind of cool toys. If you're paying attention to the news, though, NASA just announced a drone airspace regulatory infrastructure, meaning drone density could reach any amount, and they'll still be able to coordinate on a peer-to-peer -peer basis so they don't run into each other. So instead of Amazon just dropping a package by you, I promise you that within the next 10 years, you're going to see drones, quite small ones, clustering like flocks over anything that's happening. And they'll be beaming out data of a prodigious quantity. You attach sensors to every single mechanical and electrical device. You attach sensors to your body, and you attach sensors to your activities, and we now have big data, which means we're going to need data sensors I can't believe. But most of the money will be made not by the data center guys, sorry. Most of the money is going to be by the, made by the people who crunch it, analyze and find insight within it. Because that's the marginal value. I want answers. I don't want data. And the answers are tremendously powerful because they are tremendously profitable. And they will simply impinge on all of our privacy rights and we'll lose all of our privacy. Not to be pessimistic. Which I'm not, actually. I'm actually very optimistic. I just cloak it in a very pessimistic body. If so, if you want to know where we're going next year, you can look around the present. The present's right in front of us, and most of the evidence is in front of us. I couch, I mean, I put my money where my mouth is. I'm an active angel investor. And so if you look where I put my money these days, I put my money into big data analytic tools and into people providing insight on big data analytic tools because the people who provide insight today will be creating the algorithms tomorrow. And into companies, large companies, whose big data programs are being funded re beyond Wall Street's quarterly earnings cycle. So if you have a large corporation that has a big data project and it can withstand the pressure of Wall Street for a re return on capital investment tied to the next quarter, which is what a big data project would need to do. It be, need to be a well-capitalized project that lasts multiple financial periods. That's a company I'm interested in because that can't lose money. And it means that they're going to be the long company. They're, that's the next Warren Buffett play as soon as they win that territory. Because they will outgrow every other large company in the directly competitive sector. So that's where I'm making my own bets. That's where I take the money out of my pocket, which is mostly my children's inheritance, and put it speculatively to work on small innovators who are munching it and very large companies that are deploying them. Everybody else loses, period. I did say I would take questions. So why don't I stop talking and say thank you very, very much, and I'm happy to take questions.